this spiritual growth campaign called Unleashing Hope. How many of you have been here every Sunday so far? Fantastic. We've done a lot of uh, what I think are pretty practical topics. We've dealt with recharging our batteries. Last week we talked about what it means uh, to refuse to go through life alone. And today we're in a, a message and a conversation that, uh, quite frankly, I wish I wasn't giving. I wish we had a full-time teaching pastor that could have done today's message, or we had a guest doing today's message, because quite frankly, in sharing today's message, your pastor is 100% hypocrite. And I thought about that this week, and I thought, how do I share this message with any authenticity, knowing that I'm completely hypocritical in giving it? So here's what I did. I prepared today's message for me, and you can listen if you want to. Does that work for you? Because today's conversation is all about how do we replace burnout with balance. You know, the least obeyed verse in the entire Bible is Psalm 4610. Psalm 4610 says, be still and know that I am God. See, the Bible hooks, to get, hooks uh, knowing God together with being still. And so I think what we're going to, what I'm going to talk to myself about this morning, and you feel free to add your input, is what are the effects when you have a hurried lifestyle? So some of that goes like this. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a national news story about a Petco truck. Some of you may have seen it. It was driving down the street in its city. And every time the truck would stop at a traffic light, the driver of the truck would get out and take this board and just beat on the side of the truck. Then he'd get back in the truck, he'd drive to the next traffic light, he'd get out and he'd beat on the side of the truck. He'd get to back in the truck, drive to the next traffic light, yeah, and he'd get out all the way through the city. And finally, a police officer pulled him over. He said, sir, I've watched you now for multiple blocks. What are you doing? The guy said, you gotta understand, officer, this is a one-ton truck, and I have two tons of canaries in there. I have to keep some of them in the air at all times. <laughs> That's how lots of us go through life. We've gotta have a little chaos fluttering around so that life makes sense. Uh, there in your worship folder, here are some things that are real important about what's going on. 86% of Americans feel chronically stressed out. 62% of Americans say, I have burned out or I am dangerously close to burning out. 59% of Americans feel a desperate need to slow down. And today, American people sleep two and a half hours less each night than they did 100 years ago. That sound familiar to any of you out there this morning? A high percentage of us should feel like that. Uh, USA Today said uh, this in an article not too long ago. It says, today people are souped up, stressed out, and overscheduled. In this brave new world, boundaries between work and family are disappearing. Everyone is mobile, and every moment of the day is scheduled with daycare, school, and after-school activities, and 10 to 12 hour work days. The pressure. Anybody here feel that pressure? The pressure cooker lifestyle is so rare that anthropologists are now studying it to see how it will affect us. So we're gonna talk about what are the effects of living a hurried lifestyle. And fortunately, the Bible has a lot to say about this. The Gospel of Luke chapter 10, let's take a look at what scripture says. The Bible says, as Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. Now, pause right there. How cool would it be if Jesus was going into your house to be a guest today and you got to entertain him? Would you actually watch the Cardinals? And how cool would it be to have Jesus as a guest in your house? Think about that. And so she has Jesus as a guest in her house. And she had a sister called Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted. Circle that word, distracted. Because the upside of Martha's day is this. She has Jesus as a personal guest in her house. 
The downside is she ignored him while he was there. Think about it. Jesus is a guest in her house. She ignores him because she is distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. And she comes to him and she says, Lord, don't you care that my no good, lazy, freeloading, bomb of a sister, that's what it says in the Greek, freeloading, bomb of a sister has left me to do the work by myself. And then real telling line, underline that next phrase, tell her to help me. Now here's the scenario. The good news, Jesus is a guest in her house. The bad news is she ignores him. The worst news is once she starts, stops ignoring him, she starts telling him what to do. She starts giving Jesus instructions. And Jesus looks at her and he says, Martha, Martha, how many of you when you were kids knew you were in trouble when your parents used your first name and your middle name? You know, I still, I, I still can see the house I lived in. I can see myself standing down in our basement where I'd be playing and looking up the basement steps and my mom's sitting there going, David Clark! And it wasn't an affectionate tone. And Jesus looks at it and he goes, Martha, Martha. Now what is Jesus all concerned about? What's got Jesus all up in the air that like a parent, he has to use the double name? It's there in the next sentence. Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset. Anybody here this morning worried and upset about anything? It's a safe place. Be honest. God knows anyway. Now I know. Good. <laughs> You're worried and upset about many things. But few things are needed. Really only one. And Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Some of you are going, thank goodness I came today because Jesus is teaching me that I don't have to do anything in life. I can quit my job and chill forever. <laughs> well, a little context help because we're reading from Luke chapter 10. And before Luke chapter 10 is Luke chapter and Luke chapter 9 tells the story of the Good Samaritan and what we are supposed to go out and do with ourselves. So this idea that we can just quit our jobs and chill doesn't quite play up. Now here's the deal. Martha is effective and miserable. You might say it this way. Martha is successful and stressed out. Doesn't that sound like the American culture today? People are successful, but in their own home they're a mess. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to walk through the five results, the five effects of being successful but stressed. Anybody interested in listening to this self-talk this morning? Okay. Number one is this. It's pretty simple. You have more stress in life. One author said this. said, we are a piled on, stretched to the limit society. As a result, we are chronically rushed, chronically late, and chronically exhausted. I don't know if you've thought about this or not, but over the course of your adulthood, as the American landscape has begun to change, think about what companies that you use on an ongoing basis have the kinds of names they have started using to identify not just their product, but how their product can help you go through life faster and get more done. We send our packages by an organization called Federal Express. We have a cell phone company we use, it's called Sprint. We get online to manage our bank account with a, a program called Quicken. We schedule our days through our day runner. We try to lose weight with Slim Fast. We take our cars in to get the oil changed at Jiffy Lube. For you conservatives in the room, you get your information from a man named Rush. Our presidents are now depicted <laughs> on Mount Rushmore, and your kids swim in Speedos. <laughs> they have more stress in our life because we're trying to do everything faster in life. Number two, not only do we have more stress, we have less joy. Wouldn't it be great if life had a beeper or some type of a warning light to let you know that your stress was getting so high that your joy was beginning to get depleted. Folks, 
The loss of joy in your life is the warning light that you have too much stress in your life. Did you catch that? The loss of joy in your life is God's personal internal marker that you have too much stress going on in your life. Number three, the effects of a hurried lifestyle is we are less productive. The Bible says a person in a hurry makes mistakes. A few years ago, there was an engineer at Purdue University in Indiana. And this engineer was a typical guy, and so he got frustrated because it took his charcoal too long to get lit and ready for him to do his barbecue in his backyard. He thought, I'm an engineer, I can fix this, what can I do? He goes into his lab, and he gets to thinking about different things, and so here's what he does. He puts uh, the oxygen, like the pure oxygen, like some of us have breathed through for having treatment, he puts pure oxygen into some of the charcoal briquettes, and he lights it up, and it's almost instant, and then it burns for a while. And he thought about that. He thought, well, that's pretty good. I bet I can still improve upon that. He goes in a few days later. This time he doesn't put like the pure oxygen. This time he puts liquid oxygen in it. And he lights it and it burned up in his entire lab in three seconds. Some of you guys go, where can I get some of that, right? The entire way to those charcoal for that, uh, briquettes. We're less productive. Number four, we're less connected to God. See, Martha said these words that some of you have said in the last month. Some of you may have even said in the last week. Some of you may have even said in the last 24 hours. She said, Lord, don't you care? When you're less connected with God because of stress and hurry and the pace of your life, you end up with destructive emotions. Jesus is in her house, and she has no joy, and she's distracted. And I get to thinking about some Christians I know. Jesus is in your life, but your life is not marked by joy. Your life is still marked by stress and hurry. And so that's kind of the answer to that question. If you go on to number five, you get more disconnected from your family. Some of you know that I used to work with conferences and a very popular conference speaker over the last 15 or 20 years. It's been a guy named Jim Burns. Uh, Jim Burns used to start out a talk that he would do. The first time I heard it, I had sat there scared to death. Jim Burns was talking to a group of pastors at a leadership conference. He walks up the stage after being introduced and he stands there and he says, hi, I'm Jim Burns. I'm an author, I'm a pastor, I'm a speaker. And 15 years ago, I had an affair. The room got real quiet. He said, now, the affair wasn't with a woman. That caused a little buzz in the room. <laughs> he said, the affair wasn't with another man. But now we're running out of options. <laughs> and he looks this group of pastors at this leadership conference in the eye. And he said, I had an affair with my job because every ounce of my energy, every moment of my dreams, all of my effort went into thinking about doing and preparing to do and dreaming about my job. And when I heard that, I remembered a line I heard as a teenager from a pastor I had great respect for. That pastor said, when it comes to your life as a follower of Jesus Christ, if Satan can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. If Satan can't make you sin, he'll make you busy. And so here's what we want to do. We're going to walk through a little bit more in depth uh, these five life-changing questions about how to lighten the load in your life. And here's what I'm about to do. I'm going to go from preaching to myself to meddling in your life. Because the first thing we have to ask ourselves, number one, every one of us in here, is my pace of life out of control? Martha asked the question, and she says, Martha was distracted by all of the preparations that had to be made. 
Now there in your worship folder, you've got your notes that you're looking at. You also have a, se a second sheet, and one side of it says this, the Pace of Life Index. Now the Pace of Life Index, everybody in here needs an ink pen or a pencil. If you don't have one, raise your hand and Usher will get you one. You're going to need an ink pen. Because this Pace of Life Index, you're going to have five says I almost always do this or usually do this. A three is I sometimes do this, and a one says I seldom or never do this. I want you to be honest. We're going to walk through this together. I'll tell you my score at the end if you're interested. But five, three, or one, do you seem to be short of time to get everything done? The second one is this. Do you hate to wait in line? How many of you are like me? You're at Fry's or you're at Costco and you get in line and it seems like your line's not moving and then you start counting the number of things in the basket in front of you and try to figure out how much longer you're going to have to wait while you watch the next line and determine if you should shift switch lines. This past week, past couple weeks, as I'm doing the small group tour, uh, when I leave my house, if I'm not down here already, and I leave my house uh, up in Scottsdale like at 5 or 5.30 to get down here for a small group at 6 or 6.30, it takes me a little over an hour in traffic. Driving here this morning, it took me 20 to 25 minutes. And I get on the freeway, and as soon as I get on the 101, I, I do this every time. I look and I see like a, a UPS truck or some type of a pickup truck or some kind of a car that has special markings. I see what lane they're in, and I judge how I'm doing by whether I'm in front of or head behind them. I mean, you do stuff like that. We all do that. Do you eat fast? Do you drive over the speed limit? Five, three, or one. Do you seem to have little time to relax and enjoy the day? Do you find yourself overcommitted? Do you think about other things during conversation? Do you walk fast? You should try and walk through an airport with me. I can be two hours early for my flight. I've still got to beat everybody else to my gate. <laughs> do you try to do more than one thing at a time? Okay, now stop. Everybody put your pencils and pens down. How many of you are already running ahead of me doing the questions that I haven't gotten to yet? <laughs> okay, now you see that spot down there where it says bonus put five points in there. <laughs> and all the type A people said, Amen. <laughs> Do you become irritable if you're kept waiting? Do you find yourself with clenched fists or a tight neck or jaw muscles? Does your concentration sometimes wander while you think about what's coming up later? Now here's what I want you to do. I want you to take just a moment and I want you to total up your score. And those of you who got the five bonus points, don't forget those, because that was about half of you. Now here's what I want to know. How many of you in here had 35 or less? Let me see your hands. 35 or less. Okay, keep them up. Okay, how many of you had 30 or less? 25 or less? 20 or less? Well, good to know everybody else in here has a pulse. How many of you had like 21? 22? Barb had a 22. And Jeremy, would you do me a favor? Uh, Barb, you're going to need this because you apparently don't have much energy in life. The Red Bull to keep you going. Okay, now how about the other end of the spectrum? How many of you in here had 50 or more? Same people who are running ahead of you. How many of you had 55 or more? How many of you had 60 or more? Anybody here have 60? Anybody here have 59? Oh gosh, here, 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 you need this stress ball, absolutely. You need a little more relaxation. Give her a hand, would you please? The Bible says, Lord, remind me how brief my
my time on earth will be. You're going, that's why I got a 50. No, it's the other way around. It's like Martha and Mary, you've got to know what the major things are. And so you've got, to, you've got to kind of work through all of that kind of stuff. You've got to understand those types of things. And so let's move on to question number two is this. Am I running on empty? Jesus said, you are worried and upset. Now, you know that quiz you just took on one side? Turn it over. There's another one on the other side. For the sake of time, we're not going to do these this morning, but here's what I want you to do. Before you go to bed tonight, I would like you to fill this out for yourself or with your family. I've asked all of our connection group leaders that they would allow a few minutes in the connection groups this week that we could talk about this in your group. But be honest with yourself. This is for your benefit. This is actually very important stuff. You take this test. See, here's why this is so important. It's so important to me. You may or not be, may not be aware. But lots of pastors in America, the longer they're in ministry, the more cynical they get. The more critical they are of other churches. And folks, I, I don't want to turn out like that. At the end of my ministry, towards the end of my life, as I get older, I want to be more in love with God, more in love with God's church, more in love with God's people, more in love with life, and more in love with my wife than I've ever been at any point in my life. Because you can't keep your heart soft if you're always running on empty. Number three, am I dropping the right balls? real important. Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. See, many of you, the word juggling kind of describes your life. You get all these balls in the air and you're juggling those balls and all that kind of stuff. When you think about it, all of life boils down to about four different things. It boils down to your work, your faith, your health, and your family slash relationships. Now some of those things that you're juggling, they're kind of like rubber balls. You drop it, what happens? Bounces back, bounces back. Your work's a little bit like that. You didn't get that project done at work by noon on Friday. You go through this long weekend and it's still gonna be there on Tuesday. Your bosses might be a little bit upset, but you're gonna get a chance to bounce back. That, job, that job's gonna be there. The opportunity's gonna be there. It's going to keep bouncing back. Some of you, you didn't get the oil change at Jiffy Lube, apparently. But you know what? Life didn't end, did it? You'll get a chance this week or next week. You didn't get your car washed. It keeps bouncing back. Some of you didn't get your grass mowed. Or you didn't get the overseed for the change of seasons put on it. You know what? This week's another week. You drop that ball. Big home can deal. It bounces back, right? You go through life and you have all those things. Some of you are like, you know what? I planned on starting a diet this past week and starting a new exercise regime. I got it through day one and then I just kind of lost it. I dropped that ball. You know what? Next week's coming up. It's like this rubber ball. It'll bounce back. But the other arenas in your life, the other arenas in your life are like a glass ball. If you drop the glass ball, it's probably not going to bounce back. It'll get scuffed. It'll get marked up. It might even shatter, right? When you drop the glass ball. Those kinds of things that go on in your life that matter, like the growth in your faith, you can't drop that ball too many times without it getting bruised or in some of your cases shattered. Your relationships with your family, your close friends, you drop that too many times and it's going to break. At the very least, it's going to be bruised or it's going to be hindered. It's not going to be as nice as it once was. Same kinds of things with your health. You let your health go too long and it's going to shatter. And all those balls that you have in the air and you're juggling, you've got the ones that bounce back. But when you have the ones that are important, they don't. And you know what else I know? Glass balls are way more valuable than rubber ones. Right? 
Some of us are sitting in this room this morning, and because of the degree of stress in our life, because of the pace of our life, because of the hurry lifestyle that we rush through on a daily basis, are sitting in this room this morning, and we've shattered some of the most important relationships in our lives. We've shattered our faith relationship. And when we begin to shatter that, other things came into our life. And if we were to ask you to share them with the people sitting at the table with you this morning, some of us would be very embarrassed because we allowed those things to shatter. Some of us abused our bodies over the years. And at the stage we're in in life now, we're never going to get that level of health back. Our health is shattered and laying at our feet. Folks, when it comes to dropping the right balls, you've got to pay attention. Because some of the things in your life are going to bounce back and some of the things are going to shatter and they're never going to be the same again. And I don't care how good you are at putting things back together, Humpty Dumpty never made it. Number four, when I relax, do I feel guilty? Now this is real important. I want to open some of your eyes to something this morning that's going to convict you probably to the same degree it convicted me. because. This one right here, God makes a big deal about this. I don't know if you've ever thought of it in these terms. God makes a big deal about this. Because the fourth commandment of the Ten Commandments says these words. You have six days each week for your ordinary work. But the seventh day is a day of Sabbath rest dedicated to the Lord your God. Now, seventh day, God says, I want you to give a whole day to rest, that you need to rest. I heard about a pastor who, uh, after a heavy weekend of ministry, Monday was his typical day off, and this lady kept calling the church and calling the church, and he wouldn't answer, and he wasn't there, and she finally calls back to the church the next day, and he answers, and she said, I tried to reach you all day yesterday, and I couldn't reach you, and he said, well, Monday's my day off. She said, well, the devil never takes a day off. He said, that's correct, and when the devil becomes my role model, I'll let you know. <laughs> Now, this is the fourth commandment, right? You guys are familiar with the Ten Commandments for the most part? This is commandment number four. Now, let's think about the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments say you should not murder. You probably didn't do that this week. Ten Commandments say you shouldn't steal. You probably didn't do that this week. Ten Commandments say you shouldn't lie. You did this this week, but you felt convicted about it. And most of you didn't do it. Why is it that we can obey nine of the Ten Commandments, but we think it's okay with God to ignore this one? If the Ten Commandments are there for a purpose, and that purpose is for our benefit, is it possible that commandment number four is just as important as the other six? So how do you, go, how do you know if you're doing this? How do you measure this? There in your notes, number one, divert daily. Divert daily. Find a little bit of space for yourself every day. So one of the things I do is I break uh, every day into three four-hour sections. And then I work two of those four-hour sections. Whether it's 6 to 10, 10 to 2, 2 to 6. Actually, I break it into 4, 6 to 10. I work, but I always make sure I take one of those four-hour sections of the day to myself. It might be at the very beginning of the day. It might be at the end of the day. Depending on what I've got to do, it might be right smack dab in the middle of the day. But the hurt daily. Heard about a little girl who asked her dad recently, Daddy, why do you bring home work every single night? He said, sweetie, I have to bring work home because I can't get it all done when I'm at the job. At the job. And she said, well, daddy, maybe they need to put you in the slow group. <laughs> <laughs> withdraw daily, number two. Withdraw, um, divert daily, withdraw weekly. Take a day off during the week. And number three, abandon annually. Take a vacation. This is actually a very healthy strategy for what it means to live a balanced life. Now this isn't in your notes and it's not in the PowerPoint, but here's what I want you to do. 
Out to the side of each of these, I want you to write one word. Beside the verb daily, I want you to write the word relax. Some of you need to give yourself permission. Some of you need to honor God and relax. Beside withdraw weekly, write this word, refocus. By bringing your RPMs down, by withdrawing from the stress and the pressures, you get a chance to allow your body to relax. And when your body relaxes, it has a way of recalibrating itself. And abandon annually, write the word recharge. By recharging, you understand that you become the kind of person that some people want to be around. If you've ever spent time around somebody who's always rushed, always hurried, always frantic, has no margin in their life, they wear you out. They're not really a lot of fun to be around all the time. When you divert daily, withdraw weekly, and abandon annually, you become the kind of person that other people want to be around. And then number five, ask this question. Am I living a disconnected life? Now, by living a disconnected life, you begin to think, okay, then how do I get reconnected with life? And we have all kinds of possibilities, and, and our culture has lied to us and told us all kinds of things, and I'll fill you in on that in just a second. But really, to live a connected life is really simple. Turn to Jesus. See, when you spend time with Jesus, not only are you growing from his wisdom, not only are you growing from the intimacy that you have in relationship with him, but you're spending time with him, and if you're spending time with him, that means you're not exercising time doing all these other things. And Martha was so distracted with all these other things that in her own home, she didn't spend any time with Jesus. And yet Jesus says, Mary sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Now, it gets really, really important in our culture. See, sociologists and politicians and business and corporations have actually lied to the American people. They said that if you go through life faster, you'll go through life happier. I mean, think about how some of the products are positioned. Some of you remember years ago when a shampoo called Perk came out with Perk Plus. Perk Plus meant that they had a concoction of shampoo and conditioner so that you didn't have to do your hair twice. You only did it once. Now here's the deal. When Perk Plus came on the market, literally within weeks, it became the best-selling shampoo and conditioner on the entire American market. Domino's became the leading seller of pizza when they came out with this guarantee that they will give you the pizza in 30 minutes or less. And they flew to number one as the number one best-selling pizza company in America. In fact, their CEO was quoted as saying, we do not sell pizza, we sell delivery. And if you've ever tasted their pizza, <laughs> you know just how true he is. <clears throat> About the same time, Doctors Hospital in Detroit, Michigan, playing off that same slogan with their emergency room. They say, if you come into our emergency room and you're tired of waiting in other emergency rooms, we'll see you in 30 minutes or less and it works free. Their business went up 70%. The fatalities in their parking lot went up 200%. <laughs> Some of you are old enough to remember this. 50 years ago, in the American landscape, a brand new kind of restaurant that had never been heard of before came bursting onto the scene. The purpose was to help people, to help families eat faster. What kind of restaurants were they called? Fast food restaurants. That was 50 years ago. 20 years later, 30 years ago, 
People decided that fast food restaurants weren't fast enough and that the 15 seconds it took you to get out of your car and walk into the restaurant was too much time. And so they created a new addition to this fast food restaurant called the drive through And they did that so the families could eat in the car like it says to in the Bible. <laughs> Right about that same time, 50 years ago, the United States Senate developed a subcommittee to study uh, like what was going on in the American household as there were a whole bunch of new uh, <laughs> ventures and products coming out. For instance, this was right about the time that the American, uh, Americans were introduced to electric can openers and microwaves and a whole bunch of other gadgets. And after they had done a thorough study of all of that, they released this report, the U.S. Senate Subcommittee on Labor. And they said, the topic said, labor and time savings. And ladies, I, I, I hate to say this, don't kill the messenger, this was your government at its worst. <laughs> and I quote, they wrote, the number one problem in the future is American women will be asking this question, what do I do with all my free time? You got one last scripture there in your outline. It's the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11. And it's quoting Jesus. And Jesus says, Come to me. Circle the word me. Here's what's real important. I think it's growing increasingly important in American culture today. Jesus didn't say, Come to church. Jesus didn't say, Come to a religion. Jesus didn't say, come to a denomination. Jesus said, come to me. Now, why did Jesus say, come to me? Because the answer to all of that isn't a religion. The answer to all of that is a person. Every once in a while, I'll be talking to somebody, and they'll say, David, I'm just burned out. I'm just fried. And here's what I've come to realize in life. People don't get burned out because they're busy. People get burned out because they become discouraged. I can get busy and not be burned out. I've come through a real busy season here in the last few weeks. I'm still energized. But in most of life, discouragement maxes itself as burnout. And Jesus says, come to me, all you who are weary, all you who are stressed, all you who are hurried, all you who are burned out, all you who are discouraged, all you who are carrying heavy burdens, come to me and I will give you rest. That's why I said if you're living a disconnected life, the answer isn't in finding A, B, or C. The answer is in turning to Jesus. Jesus says, I will give you rest. Jesus says, I am peace. I am the way. I am the life. I am the truth. Jesus will be whatever you need him to be, but we first have to turn to him. Now here in just a moment, I'm going to pray. But I was telling somebody this past week, in my entire life, in my entire ministry, 30 years of ministry, this conversation this morning may be the most practical, biblically-based message I've ever given in my entire life to working people and the parents and the grandparents. Because as we saw a few minutes ago, a good number of us in here struggle with the pace of our lives. We struggle with hurry. We struggle with stress. And I'm just wondering if um, anybody here this morning, besides your hypocrite pastor, be willing to say, David, those are on my list too. And you want me to pray for you right now. Keep your hands up while I pray, would you? We're in this together. There's no shame. Lord God, 
I got two hands up because, as Paul said, I am the chief of sinners. I don't do life balance very well. I enjoy life. But I count the number of items in the basket or the cart in front of me. I measure the distance between me and the car that I got on this side, and the interstate this side, and I mark my progress based on where I am in relation to that car. I go through airports faster than OJ chasing hurts. I can be having one conversation with an individual right in front of me that I, it's very important to me, and I got six more going on in my head. I don't rest well, I don't relax well, and when I take a day off, I feel guilty. And God, when I was reminded that the fourth commandment, which is every bit as important as the other nine commandments, said that we are to take a day of rest, a day of Sabbath, with you, my heart was convicted. Maybe I'm not the only one in this room, Lord. Maybe there are some others in this room that the pace of their life and the stress in their life and the hurry in their life and the level of fatigue in their life and the level of exhaustion in their life is wearing them down. You know, Martha had the opportunity to sit, hang out with Jesus, have a conversation with Jesus, and she was so busy worrying about things and doing things and preparing things that she missed the most important thing, and that was you. And God, I think some of us in this room have that problem too. See, every day during this series, this campaign, we've had very brief online devotionals, and yet we don't take time. We can spend an hour or an hour and a half with our connection group and we have reasons not to be there. Some of us haven't taken care of our relationships and we haven't taken care of our bodies and we haven't nurtured our faith. The good news is, God, is that today, as the cliche says, is the first day of the rest of our lives. We can't change yesterday, but we can choose tomorrow. So God, as we would reflect on this conversation, as we would take that second little survey quiz home and spend a little bit of time with it, pray, God, that you would speak into our lives. For all those people who raise their hands, whether it's stress or hurry or fatigue or exhaustion or some of the specifics that I spoke about in this conversation this morning, I pray, God, that you would meet them at their point of need. God, we love you. We worship you. We honor you, and we give you all praise and thanksgiving in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.